Yeah, so um, hmm. so this book here, um, we can start talking about it a little bit. Um, behind every lie, Behind Every Lie by Christina McDonald. Um, this book is a psychological thriller and um, it has so many twists and turns um, to this book, which is waiting on the author to log on and momentarily. Um, I just wanted to add also, um, did you all know that she orig she's originally from Seattle? Did you all know that? Because one of the, um, in her book, the setting was in Seattle as well. Did you all know that about her? No. Yeah. Um, I was reading something up on her to, to this morning, actually, before we came on. And it stated that she was originally uh, from Seattle. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, Seattle, Washington. Um, but yeah. So, um, as we're regarding into this book, I want to talk about the beginning of the book. Um, it started off as um, with Eva and Lamb as a couple. And then it talked about um, Lim's father rejected him at the age of 16 years old. So um, this book, it actually uh, mentioned a lot of different topics that was um, relatable as far as in real life issues that's going on, you know. And of course, while I was reading the book, I'm like, I can definitely see this as a movie. But um, the rejection with his father um, Liam's father at 16, you know, uh, it just made me think about a lot of other um, kids, I should say, um, whose father has also um, rejected them as kids. You know, uh, a lot of kids, we talked about that. And, and, and the funny thing I also want to mention, we read the book, What Happened to You Last Month. It seems as if, did you all notice kind of like it's tied together, the two, as far as like different topics that we spoke about that was also related in the other book from last month? Did you all notice that? Or was it just me? I wasn't even trying to connect them. No? Okay. Because no. I, I did notice that. I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing that we talked about trauma from last month. And the book spoke about family trauma. I mean, you know, even she said it in the book, um, it was towards the end, but she, this book spoke about, it was dealing with family trauma, um, rejection, um, dealing with fear, you know, just certain things really stuck out that I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is crazy. Cause <laughs> you know, everything, I mean, everything, every book that we read is, you know, I, I'm always the, everything happens for a reason. Every book we read is supposed to be read, you know, it's all done by the universe you know I'm all into that so <laughs> it was just it that that just really stuck out to me about this book here and I want to also add it talked about the memory remember with Eva having her brain um couldn't remember certain things you know um yeah yeah all that was connected from last month it's what my, it's what I noticed the connections um so yeah that was just something I wanted to mentioned before um we all get started in the book or whatever and talk about that um what else did i want to talk about um hmm Um, the, bit, the book also mentioned Kintsugi, the Japanese art. I posted that on Facebook as well. Um, that was something that I noticed that I was like, um, that was very new to me. I, don't I'm, I like art, but I don't really know a lot about art. Um, but just the meaning of the Kintsugi, how it um, 
it, it spoke about how the, the broken the broken pieces on the art it it seals it back together in a golden type of um flag or I guess I should say a, a golden type of stream. Um I made a yeah, post about it. I don't know. The, oh I was about to uh, yeah I'm sorry I was just chiming in. That was actually gonna be my question for the officer but oh, okay, about okay, so okay, yeah. because uh yeah. yeah the the goal the goal the goal highlights the flaws and I was just, that's that's the purpose of the art that it highlights the flaws as in we are, our, you know, that our flaws actually, you know, we are not in spite of them, but because of them. So it could be a beautiful thing that we're all flawed pieces. And I just wanted to ask her about that metaphor that's had throughout the book. But I was very mm -hmm. interested in that, actually. Oh, um, wow. Look at that. Look at that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So. Same page. Yeah. Okay. And, she, <laughs> and it was that she, she actually talked about that in the Japanese study ethos, and it was talking about the same thing. Um, she mentioned that later in the book as well. So I wanted to know how she uh when when um okay, let me see who explained that to her. Oh, um her her actual father when he was and when she went to go visit him in the cancer war, he the one that explained he tied ethos to you know Kensuke. Yeah, so he actually talked about that, and because um um. Give me a second. Uh, Eva had didn't know anything about it, and he explained what it was when she went to go see him and you know see her father for the first time in person. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, very, very, yeah. very, fa very fascinating. Actually, I thought that was extremely mm -hmm. interesting, and I I appreciated the uh, English literature aspects and spiritual aspects of that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. um, I was just saying, like I have also you know been into art, um, I've, I'm always looking at um, African art and different pieces and stuff like that. But just when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, you know, and it was so beautiful. I mean, um, I looked at a lot of the potteries, um, of course, online, and I was like, oh, wow, this is gorgeous, you know, and like, had never heard of anything like that. And then, like I say, it's also about culture, you know, different cultures and stuff like that. So I just um, wanted to point that out. That was a really special uh, piece in the book, I should say. So, yeah. Um, uh, so I'm glad you had um, also had that on your mind as well, Tabitha. Um, what else I should say? Um, Did anybody else want to talk about anything that stuck out to them in the book? I mean, anything that you want to discuss while we're on here waiting for her to come on? Anybody? No. I found it interesting that the um she wanted to she didn't want to give her back to her real mother, but she couldn't allow herself to show her the love that she really should have. So I found that interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. I mean, um, there was so many points that was interesting in this book, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, even... When they were kids, you know, starting when they were little kids, you know, uh, Eva and Laura playing and her mama being the nanny, you know, it's like, I thought she was going to tell her, no, nah, I, I don't have time to be no nanny. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? I just say it to Okay, she's here. Let me, let me put her in. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you can you hear me? Yes. How oh, are good. you? I couldn't get it to log on on my phone, and I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> so I'm on my laptop. Oh, it's all working uh, fine. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I'm so happy to have you join us today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. This is such a pleasure. How are you guys? <laughs> good. Okay. Nice to have you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I might just turn my light down. I look very shiny. <laughs> Where is everybody from? 
Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, Chicago. We based Chicago. out of Chicago. So do you guys all know each other like yeah. in, in real life too? Oh, yeah. Oh, and then you do the book club. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We actually, okay, let me tell you a, a little bit about us. Yeah. So we, we, um, we meet six months face to face. Okay. And then we do six months on Zoom. Um, when we first started, we started in 2019. And what we did was, um, th- it was um, originally supposed to be always we go outside 12 months a year, you know. Yeah. But when um, COVID Lockdown. <laughs> came, it, yeah. it kind of changed everybody. And it yeah. changed all the plans. And we stopped for a little while. Yeah. And um, we decided to go on Zoom, you know. Yeah. Uh, Thanks God, Tabitha, uh, she's one of the members, Tabitha Franklin, she um, was like, she called me because we, we stopped for two months, you know, we didn't know what to do. I'm like, we can't go outside. I don't know. Uh, everything was put on hold. So she called me and was like, hey, we should do Zoom. And I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. You know, but I had only been on Zoom at that time for 30 minutes with somebody. So I was like, I don't really know how it works. But she was kind enough and generous enough to allow me to, uh, to us to use her her uh, Zoom information. Yeah. And it was yeah. no time limit. So uh, she was like, play around with it, get familiar with it. And we yeah. did that for a couple months. And then eventually um, I got my own account. And uh, after, you know, after we got back outside, I was like, well, should I still keep it? I don't know. And I was like, you know what? I think I kind of like it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice alternative. And I just kept it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. So I, I decided we'll do six months on Zoom and six months off, you know? That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of my <laughs> author calls on Zoom <laughs> because I live in London, so <laughs> it's um uh-huh. I can't can't just can't like travel around and try to go into bookshops and all that anymore. It's just way too much to try to fly from London over to anywhere really in the New York in like New York or Seattle. I'm from Seattle, oh. um, but yeah, it's just too much. <laughs> Yeah, I just told them that actually, I was like, did you all notice that she's from Seattle? I saw yeah. a little biography about you. I was like, oh, she's from Seattle, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just grew up there. Yeah, born and raised. And then I moved. Um, I went to university in Ireland. <laughs> I just, yeah, after 9-11, wow. I decided to go traveling. So I, I worked and I saved up for a year. And then I went traveling around Europe and I ended up in Ireland and I really liked it there. And I found out there was a master's degree in journalism at one of the universities. So I applied and I got in and um, it's a lot cheaper to go abroad than it is to go to university in America. So I was like, cool. (laughs) So I went abroad. And then while I was abroad, while I was in Ireland, I met my husband. (laughs) Wow. Look at that. Amazing. So everything was meant for a reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll just jump right in, start with the questions. Yeah. And we'll start with Tabitha because we were just talking about Kintsugi. We were talking about that. And yes. she said she had a question for you. So go ahead, Tabitha. Yeah. Uh, first of all, wonderful book. Uh, thank completely you. amazing. Uh, and it's wonderful to meet you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, I was very fascinated. I never had heard of it at all. Um, you know, I am interested in Japanese culture just because of the yeah. connection with mind and body. So immediately um, I looked it up, but yeah. I was curious about um, the way you weaved the idea and the concept of Kintsugi throughout the book, because I yeah. know it appeared in more than just the, you know, the, um, the explicit terms, you know, cause yeah. I know it was like metaphorical as well. So I just wanted yeah. to talk a little bit about how you weave that idea throughout the book with the characters and the plot yeah so when I first sat down to write this book obviously I'm assuming you guys have all read it right so I'm not giving any spoilers or anything so the the story is based on Emily Doe well it's not based on it was inspired by reading Emily Doe's victim impact statement after she was sexually assaulted in 2015 and the her victim impact statement came out in 2016 and I was really I was just shook you know I was like what, how can you go on? You know, that that has happened to you, but you don't remember it. You've been violated in that way. And so I started researching you know, sexual assaults and how women deal with it. And women specifically, because my book is centered around men and I, or women. And I know men experience that too, but my book is centered around women. Um, and one of the main words that they use to explain how they felt in these situations was the word broken. And that kept coming up over and over and over. 
And I was like, well, how do you heal when you're broken? And so I started looking up and just Googling and researching different ways of like how people heal when they've been broken or when they've been traumatized. Um, and, and it just, Kintsugi happened to come up in a Google search. And I was so intrigued by that idea of having something like pottery and how, and the pictures were so beautiful. So I got my own Kintsugi kits and I started doing Kintsugi myself and like getting um, like a pottery or a china or glass or whatever and breaking it <laughs> and then putting it back together like gluing it back together with gold so i'd mix that it was like a gold powder not real gold but like a gold powder that you you mix into like an epoxy glue and putting them all together and how you don't know what way it's going to break or what scars or lines are going to form but it is beautiful at the end of the day and um and it was a really informative and beautiful experience for me learning that and teaching myself that of like taking something that's broken and making it whole but but not just whole whole with beautiful scars and how it can be even more beautiful afterwards and so I really loved that and how like you said that it spoke to like the external plot of the story but also Ava's sort of character journey is as she's discovering how who she is and and that you know she isn't broken she is a whole person and so that that's how and why I, I wove it into the storyline thank you uh thorough <laughs> and completely wonderful answer I, this, uh, I do want a, a quick follow-up um and not Tanisha is that okay go ahead okay um did you were you uh purposely trying to connect Kensugi to Wabi Sabi as well so forgive me if I forget anything because I wrote this book in 2016. So remind me what wabasabi is. The Japanese philosophy. The, the father did the father connect that? Explain that in the hospital when um, Eva met him for the first time. Explain that yes. philosophy. Is that sounding familiar? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Wabasabi. Okay. Oh, I can't really remember what happened at the end of the book. <laughs> okay. 2016. Okay. I've written a okay. lot of books since then, so it's like okay, what that. happened in that one. But yeah, okay. I mean, what was the what? What did you want to know about? Well, the... no, it was it was a philosophy, and I just wanted to know about yeah. the connection. But honestly, um, even without that, I feel like I can understand your yeah. connection with Kintsugi to that. So thank you so much. I appreciate your answer. I think the the larger theme was about Kintsugi itself rather than wabasabi. It's more okay. just about that that being able to mend what is broken within yourself, but in an external way. So that reflects the theme in that way. If that makes sense. It makes absolute sense. Thank you. Okay, did anybody else have a question? Oh, Ebony, I know you had a question about, um, we was talking before she came on and you had a question about um, Eva. Yeah, I was wondering what made you decide to uh, let Eva keep Ava instead of returning her to her birth mother, given that she was unable to allow herself to show a, a true love to her you mean cat who, yeah. who do you mean sorry yeah uh, no that's all right again it's been a long time since i wrote this so i want to make sure that i'm getting <laughs> i'm understanding the question so say that again so the was cat who who kept the daughter when, yeah. then when the, the the birth mother uh found them she didn't want to return her and I yeah. was wondering what made you stick with that line of plot, given that Kat was unable to show her the true love of a mother? Yeah, I mean, I think that Kat, Kat was um, emotionally stunted, I think, because of her past. And it wasn't that she didn't love Ava. She did love Ava very much. But yeah, yeah you're right. She had a hard time expressing that in terms of physical you know, a hug or a kiss, which obviously children need physical love and affection as well. So Ava felt neglected, but I think Kat felt like she was doing her best and Ava was her daughter. So why would she give her up <laughs> in, in her mind? Right. And then Kat was quite a, a stubborn or is quite a stubborn dogmatic woman. So she's worked very hard to raise Ava and to keep her safe all these years. Why would she give her up in her mind? because she's her daughter. Right. Okay. I was so just curious was my, about that. When I when I make 
character when I have characters kind of make their decisions, it's based on the character that I know that they are, what I think they will do in that situation. And different characters react differently. And you know what? Sometimes those those reactions are really apparent in the first draft. And sometimes they don't come out until later. But in this one, I knew because Kat is very, she's just a very stubborn woman and she's very dogmatic about the way that she does things. So these decisions she makes, she makes them and she does not regret them. She just moves forward. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, honestly, I, I thought I was, I figured I knew why she didn't give her up because that is her daughter. It made sense to me. However, yeah. at the end, she did express some regret yeah. to Rose. Lily. And that's what kind of, you know what I mean? Like, okay, but I understand these are full complex people. You write them like real human beings. There's yeah. no black and white. But yeah, she actually herself was like, maybe I was selfish. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though, um, you know, I think it was probably the best decision. I think everybody, you know, yeah. uh, at, least at the time, at least yeah. at the time. And you're Thank so you. right. Like these people are, are multifaceted. I, that's my, what I really try to do when I'm writing a character is like, there's no black and white, you know, there's no, like everybody is making these decisions and going, well, maybe I am making the right decision, but maybe I'm wrong. But all you can do is make that decision, you know? And then of course you can look back on it and what, you know, what they say, what is the saying? Hindsight is, is 2020, right? But you don't know that until you've made that decision. And so you can make a decision and, and, and um, Kat especially would go, well, I'm making the decision and moving forward. And then she'd look back and go, well, maybe I made the wrong one, but I did my best. I noticed you also stated in the book that Kat had structure. She stated that when they she were talking what? at the end, she had structure. Hmm. When um, Eva was talking to uh, Lily at the end, she was like, Kat had structure. I gave you fun, you know, and the, I yeah. showed you a good time. You know what I mean? So yeah. I thought that was like, oh, wow. You know, you always yeah. have a mother and an aunt, you know what I mean? Yeah. Giving you discipline and you have that other fun auntie that's going to be like, let's go have fun. Let's go do this, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I noticed that was the difference between them, you know? And um, yeah. So, yeah. so she thought she was giving Ava the best of both worlds. Exactly, exactly. Um, Danae, you had a question as well. Go ahead. I just wanted to know, um, what inspired you to write in the beginning? What made you want to be a writer and write books? I get asked this question a lot and I'm not really sure the answer to that. I've always wanted to be a writer. When I was like really young, I have two younger sisters and before I could even write like actual sentences, I would draw pictures. And then when I started writing, I would write stories and just, you know, nonsensical ones. Like my first story was about these, these girls with, gold hair like actual like literal gold hair so they could pluck their hair out and change it in for cash and then they could go buy as many sweets as they wanted <laughs> so I've always just kind of told stories and loved telling stories um and I evolved from telling sort of fairy tales like that to telling more like I guess woman's fiction sort of stories and then I move from there into thrillers. I'm not sure why I get darker the older I get, but I've just always loved telling stories and loved writing. And when I when I went to to college and then and to university, I did a degree in journalism. So I've always been a writer in some way or another. And I never thought that I'd actually be able to make money as an author because it seems very, you know, like just one of those careers that's like way out there, right? Um so I didn't think I'd ever really be good enough to do that, but I worked really hard at it and I did journalism for a number of years. And then I moved into copywriting and, and wrote for like different travel brands online. And I, I all the while I was also writing stories at home and kind of practicing my craft. And, and so I've always, I guess the shorter, <laughs> that's a very long answer, but the short answer is I've always wanted to be a writer and I've always written stories and so it's just always been something I've wanted to do it isn't something that I was ever outside of me I always wanted it thank you yeah anybody else all right well I'll go I have a question for you yeah um, my question, well, I love the book of, of, uh, just start with that. I love the book. It kept me on my toes, 
Oh, okay, you. the whole time I'm trying to figure out who the killers, who did this, who poisoned <laughs> us. I'm trying to figure it out, and I cannot figure it out for the life of me. <laughs> I mean, this book has so many twists and turns, you know. Um, you. But my question is, um, how did you come up with the plot and characters for this book? So for me, plot usually comes from some little thing that really strikes me. And and it not only strikes me, but it stays with me and it kind of percolates in my head. And then I get what, it sounds so woo-woo, but I get what I call the aura of the story. So when something really gets like triggered in my mind, I have a feeling of an, a, like a sense of the story where I'm like, I have this feeling, it's very vague, but I have a feeling about the story and I need to write it. And then this, the story kind of, the plot sort of takes shape. So I knew, I, I usually know my, what's called the inciting incident, which is what the story, what launches the story. So Ava gets struck by lightning. She wakes up in the hospital and her mother is dead. Did she do it? That sort of premise, that was my first kind of idea. And then I, I sit there and I let it percolate in my head and I just feel it. You know, I feel if how if it's going to be emotional or if it's going to be twisty i just have this feeling of it and from there i write i start writing the story i don't find out the character until i've started writing the story and i don't plot so that means that i'm writing a lot and then i go back and i delete a lot <laughs> and i go write some more and then i go back so i do a lot of editing as i go and um i mean it's really messy it's 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 very messy and super disorganized but it's just how i work like i don't i can't i can barely even play chess i just don't organize my thoughts that way like <laughs> my desk is very organized but I don't think you know 12 steps ahead so I find these things out as I go as I'm writing I'm learning about my character and I'm learning what their past is and and their past traumas and different little quirks that they might have and I'm getting to know them as a person not just a flat character and how they each bounce off of each other that's important too and and so there's no real, like, I'm not one of those authors that sits down and writes a 12 page character study. I don't do that. I learn my character through the plot. And I always start with plot, but I also start with like a feeling about that plot. And that's really difficult to describe. It's more like in here and then the plot comes out and from the plot, then the characters come out too. And then I, actually wow. after I finished my first draft, I have to start over <laughs> because that's basically the outline. <laughs> so there's a lot of, it's kind of like if you have a, like an ice sculpture, right? You just have a chunk of ice and then you chip away at it. And at the end you have this, this polished work, but it takes, you know, a lot of time to get it to be that polished bit of work. So it's a lot of drafts and a lot of editing for me. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. Um, one of our members, Tabitha, who was asking a question, she's having problems with her technical difficulties. She um, wanted to know what does she expect to happen between Jacob and Eva? Well, I would hope that after the story finishes that they would be together, right? Like, I like there to be something that, you know, my reader can grasp onto because, you know, there's a lot of drama that happened and a lot of trauma that happened to poor Eva. I'd want her to be really happy afterwards. So I think that they would get together and I think that it would maybe be a struggle for Ava at first because she would have some problems trusting, right? Like I would, <laughs> um, but I think they would work through that. Yeah, yeah. I think I, the way I feel like, I think that they were going to possibly get together too. I mean, yeah. once Liam died, I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's right there. They've been together since they were kids, you know, yeah. and there's already a little spark there anyway you know yeah, yeah. So that would be definitely great if they did get together yeah. so I, like I kind of figured that in my mind mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um I also wanted to know where did you go to write the book did you write it at home did you have to go somewhere in a quiet space like where did you write the book behind every line write the book my books at home um I have a, a small little I'm literally in my bedroom but I have a small little nook in my bedroom with like books and a little space I have lots of plants and stuff like that and um my my I have two kids and they're old enough now that they're both in school so when they're at school I write and I, I try to be really disciplined about that so that because if I didn't if I wasn't disciplined I wouldn't get any words written <laughs> So I'm really disciplined. As soon as they're off at school, I write, then I get off work and then I go collect them from school. 
Um, but yeah, I work from home. I don't need to go. I don't go anywhere else to, to do anything now. I, I did. Um, so after I signed my book deal for the night, Olivia fell, which is, was my first book. I, I was working full time. I was writing in the evenings. I was also trying to be a mom and make dinner for my kids and just be present. And I found it to just be a little bit too much. And I was feeling really frayed. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to make some decisions here about because, you know, we can all we can do it all right, but not at the same time. And so I had to be really clear about what am I going to do right now? So I decided to um, to quit my job and really focus all of my efforts onto writing and trying to make a, a living at that. So now I do that full time. Well, not full time, but full time when my kids are at school. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was going to be one of my other questions I wanted to know. Like, when did you realize that you were going to become an author, you know, and do it yeah. as a, a long, a lifelong career? You know? Yeah. Like, when did you decide, like, this is what it's going to be. I'm not, I don't have anything else to do. I'm going to be an author, yeah. you know. So I decided that when I signed the, the book contract for the night Olivia fell, I I decided that I was like, I'm going to make this work. Um, but being in publishing looks easy from the outside, but there's actually a lot of heartbreak and a lot of stories that I've written that haven't sold. So when I write a book, it, it takes say six months, anywhere from three to six months. And then I have to send it out to my agent and then my agent has to approve it. Then my agent has to, once she's approved it, send it out on submission to editors. Now that book might not sell. And if that book doesn't sell, that's six months that I've just wasted. Right. So I have to be really careful about how I uh, use my time and how I make sure that I'm always writing so that I have the next project to give to her and, and the next one. So I didn't realize that <laughs> when I first decided to do this job. Um, that it was going to be is I think difficult and tricky. Uh, and I think there's a lot of rejection and a lot of like negativity um, being an author that you just have to grow a really thick skin and go, I'm writing for me because I like doing it because I love it. I'm passionate about it. And because I have something to say that I want to share with people. And, um, and so it's just inside of me and I, I do it anyways. Yes, that's the key word. I always hear you have to be passionate about something yeah. because I know being a writer, being an author is not easy. You know, yeah. you don't know it. Once you write it, you don't know if well, people like it. You got so many yeah. questions in your mind. Are, are they going to like it? Are they going to love it like I did? You know, are they yeah. going to find it interesting? Are they going to even read it? You know, are they going to read my book? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm then yeah, we have it. to deal with like reviews and we have to deal with that. Did the editor like it? And do they, are they backing it? Did they put marketing into it? I mean, there's so much business side to it that I didn't even realize I've kind of learned on the job. I wish somebody would have shared that with me actually, <laughs> but maybe if they had, I would have been like, Oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Did but you now have a mentor? Pardon? Did you have a mentor? No. No, no. Oh, wow. And you know what? The book publishing industry is really closed mouth because they don't, nobody wants to bad mouth it because they don't want to get sidelined. Exactly. So it's, it's really, it's a very tricky, very closed industry, but it's hard. It's a really hard industry. Um, you know, it's very isolating. I'm writing alone all day. So, you know, you need, it's difficult to make connections sometimes, but at the end of the day, when I do make those connections, it means so much to me. And I love the process. I love the writing and I love telling stories. And so I feel like, and I love my readers and I love the Instagrammers, all that. So I feel like I have the best job in the world, even though there are these really difficult things that I feel like people should talk about more. Yeah. Yes. I want to say you really touched on a lot of relatable uh, topics in this oh, book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. I know you say you don't remember the book and you don't remember this. And, but I mean, you spoke about a lot of things, uh, but I'll get to that later. Anybody else have questions? Anybody else? I did. Um, I do. do you oh, ever oh, yeah. write write your books based on like real life experiences? Are any of your characters based on actual people in any of your books? No. Um, so all of my characters, you know, they come from my heart. So I suppose there's like a thread of me in, in each of them. But the way that I build my characters is the most important information is what I call my character ghost. And the character ghost is basically something in their past that has affected the way they are now. So, you know, if they were, um, 
oh, what's one that would be really, oh, for example, okay, Ross in Friends, right? So his wife was a lesbian. And so he's really hesitant to trust anybody because he thinks that everybody is going to leave him. So having that character ghost and how it affects the re like their reasons for doing things, their motivations is so important to me. And obviously that's, that's not uh, these characters. They, they come from my heart, but they're not me. <laughs> you know, I don't have each of their backstories. Um, but yeah, so having that backstory and then also like really drilling into what are their values? What are their motivations for acting like this? Um, and then also some of the kind of more quirky things like, in my new new book that I'm writing right now, my character absolutely hates wearing socks. You know, so just funny things like that. And sometimes they come from me. I hate wearing socks. I don't like socks. They bunch up and they really bug me. <laughs> but, you know, like, so there are some things like that or there's something, maybe I saw somebody at the coffee shop and they kind of twirl their hair in a funny way. And I put that into a book. So there'll be these little, little things, but mostly they're just their own person that I kind of build. And they're built specifically for that book because I want to torture them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, anybody else want to go? I have a question if nobody else does. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, so uh, Christina, you kind of answered this question. My, I did have a question. Did you begin with the end in mind? But you already kind of explained how your characters tell you where to go, like you develop them into real people, yeah. uh, which I think is extremely fascinating because it feels like they have a mind of their own almost. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of answered my question that they tell you where to go. However, I do want to know, as far as the ending goes, did you have any idea about where any piece fit in when you started? As in, because there were so many moving parts. Yeah. So did you have an idea about any of the different facets about as far as Seb goes and, um, you know, uh, uh, Eva's real father, uh, who yes. actually killed who, did you have any idea about any of those pieces when you started? So it depends on the book. <laughs> um, every book is different. Every book is a different journey. Um, so my, my most recent book that's coming out next week, I knew the ending that I wanted for that. Um, but usually I don't know the ending. I know different elements of it. So in this book, I did know about Seb and I also knew about Rose. Um, I'm trying to think, what else did I know? I knew some elements of it, but in general, the big reveal, that big kind of climax at the end is a surprise to me too. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Wow. Um... I wanted to just point out some things that, like I was thinking, saying with your topic, um, you spoke about the rejection. Um, this is uh, you talked, you spoke about mother and daughter uh, relationships, like you said yeah. in your book. Um, sexual assault, you mm -hmm. know, these are really deep topics that is really people are having um, that's dealing with people are dealing with this today. You yeah. know, um, it spoke about death, um, secrets, and domestic violence. Yeah. You know, there was there were some really sensitive topics that you spoke about in your books that really um made me want to talk to you, you know, about those things. Yeah. Like yeah. um you spoke about the person Emily Doe yeah. and she dealt with sexual assault. Is is, is where, where I don't know anything about this Emily Doe. Is she a real person? I mean Yeah, yeah. So in 2015 there was this big story about this um this girl at the time they called her Emily, Emily Doe, her real name came out much later and it was Chanel Baker. So um, she was walking home after she went to a fraternity party and these two foreign exchange students saw a boy sexually assaulting her and she was um, blacked out. She had had, she'd been roofied, I believe the, 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 is what had happened. So she didn't remember any of it. And she ended up going to the hospital and getting a rape kit done. And they found like all these leaves and everything down there. And just like, she was horrifically sexually assaulted. And the guy who sexually assaulted her, Brock Turner was his name. He was on the swim team at Stanford and he only got six months of jail because the judge decided that it would be very bad for him to be in jail for longer than that. And so Emily Doe 
wrote this victim impact statement and she said something really powerful at the beginning. She said, um, what was it? She said, let me just look. I, I opened the article earlier and she said, yeah, her first words were, you don't know me, but you've been inside me. And that's why we're here today. And I was just like, oh, you know, you know, and I, I've, of course, like I went to college, like I have so many girlfriends, we all went to fraternity parties and so many girls have been sexually assaulted. And for a judge to come out and say that the, the man who did that, it would ruin his life to go to jail for something he did. I was like, that's so wrong. Like, how does she go on from this? How would you go on from this? You know, and it just impacted me a lot. And I like talking about serious issues. I think we should talk about serious issues. We shouldn't be hiding from them because then how do you fix them if you don't talk about them? Right. So I, I wanted to talk about it. And um, in the publishing world for commercial fiction, there's a lot that they won't publish. And so they, they didn't want me to write any of the, the scenes of like talking about the sexual assault. Like they deleted all of that because they don't want it to be too grim or too traumatizing you know of course it, you know it's a it's a trigger warning right so they have to be careful about it so there was a really fine line that we had to walk in terms of what I could um explore and talk about in the in that book okay, but you, you should look at the story it's a really um it's a very powerful story her impact statement is so powerful and it really moved me and it it moved me so much that I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that that's why I wrote this book. Yeah, yes, the, I remember, I remember that story. Yeah. yeah, I remember that story. Cause I, I remember when the judge said he didn't want to ruin that young man's life. And I'm thinking he didn't care about ruining her life. Right. And I was like, how did the boy get away with it? And I yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I, I just like, I feel like, so the judge, I feel like you a rapist. <laughs> that's in my head. That's where I went with him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do remember that because that was horrific. Like she yeah. was assaulted twice to me by the yeah. man and then the legal system. You're right. It's so true. And then and then Brock Turner's father wrote a, a statement talking about his son shouldn't spend 20 years of his life yeah. in prison for 20 minutes of action. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes of and he called it that action. Oh, it's yeah. so horrifying. Yeah, really gross. Horrible. That really Horrible. impacted me. Yeah. I know too also with the book, I was totally not expecting for her fiance to be her attacker. That threw me. I was <laughs> like, you know, because sometimes you think you know where a book is going. Yeah. And I that one, I was like, yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Oh, good. <laughs> at all. <laughs> that's one of the few things that I did have plotted. So that's really good to know. <laughs> and it was a surprise. Yeah. Tabitha had a question. Go ahead, Tabitha. Yep. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Christine, <laughs> Christine, I wanted to talk about uh, cast sexual orientation only yeah. because I wanted to know, because I felt like it wasn't really delved into, you know, yeah. something, okay, maybe it wasn't a huge part of her character. So I want you to discuss that a little bit. And also to was she in love with Lily? She was very much in love with Lily. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I think, you know, especially back in her, her day, you know, when she was a teenager, that wasn't accepted, especially in the UK. That wasn't, you know, an accepted way to live. And so she would have been living very much in hiding and not accepting of herself. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, Sometimes I have a character where like, that's not really a part of the plot. It's just her character. And I think I wanted to really show that she's, she wasn't accepting of herself and she needed to be, that was very much a character need is that she needed to accept herself the way Ava needed to accept herself, the way that, that Rose needed to accept herself. And so acceptance of all of your self is a big theme within this book. And so I wanted to make it that Kat was a lesbian but she didn't accept that about herself. Okay. So okay. that was a character more than um, plot driving point. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? 
I wanted to talk about um, the secrets and the lies throughout this book. Um, <laughs> it just made me think about families that have these long kept secrets that no one ever talk about. I mean, yeah. it's like buried somewhere, locked up, and yeah. it never comes out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the good thing is that with this book, some of the lies did come forth. You know what I mean? Because if you think about it, Kat and Eva, no, Kat and Rose kept this lie for so many years. Yeah. I yeah. mean, since the girl was three years old, whole, she's now an adult, yeah. you know? Yeah, the whole their whole adult life and her entire, Ava's entire life. <laughs> yeah. That's mind blowing. <laughs> and it happens so often. And those secrets are the most interesting part, right? <laughs> I want to know yeah. all the secrets. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, she was a whole nother person, took on a whole nother person's name, you know? And yeah. you wake up one day, you are not even my daughter. Yeah. You're not, that is not even your name. Like, yeah. yeah. How do you wrap your <laughs> you head around it? Deal with that. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, how do you even, how, how? I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm speechless. I don't even know. <laughs> and I know it's just a book, but I'm just saying, like, if that was to happen, you know, I mean, maybe it does happen somewhere in the world, I'm sure, you know, I mean, oh, some yeah, people perhaps. get adopted all the time or somebody raised another person and they keep it a secret. They don't say anything, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then I wanted to talk about it at the end of the book when, um, when, uh, Eva's daughter, you know, uh, Lily had her picture, you know, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, she has this little girl's picture, you know, yeah. and I just knew, and, and Lily told her, you know, hey, I'm a good investigator, you know, I found you guys, like, I you want me to find your daughter? Yeah. Just say the word, I will find yeah. her, and yeah. Eva was like, basically, no, yeah. even where she is. Yeah. That that was courageous of her to even say that because I just knew she was gonna be like, yes, yeah. get on it. I want to meet my daughter. It's been so long, especially yeah. about her mother dying, her husband dying. Yeah, you want you kind of want something to fill that void, you know? And it's like yeah. I think it's time for me to reconnect with my daughter, you know, or at least yeah. go find out where she's at. Something about her she didn't want to know anything about. Her. She was fine with was the picture. Hard. That was hard to write because you know, as a writer and as a reader, you do want closure right you do want that happy ending but I always want to stay really true to my characters and true to the plot and I think that Ava would have been like no I'm I'm okay to leave her and let her be happy where she is now because she's really happy and I want that for my child right like so that was really selfless of her so I always try to be true to that and I think you know maybe it makes the book a little bit sadder but I always try to be really true to what I think would actually happen <laughs> And I think that was very selfless of her to go, actually, I want her happiness first. Also, too, you know, I read it as if it came full circle, like almost yeah. like yeah. she could understand why her mother or why Kat did the same. You it know is. what I mean? She yeah. made a decision that was best for her. Yeah. So I feel like that, you know, and that, you know, that I feel like Eva grew up and became yeah. a mother because she made the decision best for her daughter yeah. the same like her mother did. So I thought that was actually a full circle moment. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. You made that connection because I kind of felt that way too. Like, I guess you just like, let's leave it alone. You yeah. know, leave her where she's at. I don't want to, you know, open a can of worms. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, like, you know, that. maybe she would be really destabilizing the girl's life and she didn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And by her talking to Rose, um, at that time and and that was another shocking I did not know Aunt Lily was Rose you know what I mean like I'm still trying to figure out where Rose at <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um so when she when Rose talked to um I should say Aunt Lily when Aunt Lily talked to Eva her kind of just having that one-on-one -on -one by her mother not being here it just kind of made an ease on her like okay I understand the pain that my mom and, and my aunt went through, you know, I should just yeah. leave this alone. And I understand it was for their, for my best interest, but that's what it all was about. Yeah. You know, to keep her safe and to keep her and have her best interest um, come first before yeah. anything. Yeah. You know? And I think, so, yeah, yeah when, I, I 
when you have kids that, and you are a mother, you're just like, that is like a, you do try, right? You want to try, but maybe you're making the wrong decision. All you can do is your best. And so that's what she, that's what they were all trying to do. <laughs> Lily and Ava and um, Kat, like they were all trying to do well, what was best for those that they love for their daughter. And it's just not an easy answer all the time. Yeah. It's not black and white. It's kind of gray. You know what I mean? Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of things that happen in, in the middle. Yeah, those you know shades I mean? of gray. Yeah. 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 Anybody else have questions? No, but I just wanted to say that I thought the um book was so packed full of like action. Like I felt like it was so much going on, like the mom. <laughs> And the daughter, they were out to dinner. And then the next thing she's waking up in the hospital, the mom is <laughs> dead. And did she, did she kill her mom? Like, why would she kill it? Cause they seemed like they were having a good time out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> and then when she went to London and got all this other information, I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> and um, so somebody mentioned earlier about her fiance or being the, uh, person that caused her the harm I'm yeah. at that point now because I didn't finish the I didn't finish yet but I'm going to finish but I was kind of thinking that I don't know oh. what, I, what I was listening <laughs> to you know that, and I'm like was it him like that is so crazy but it's so <laughs> much like it's just a whole lot going on in the book and it actually it really does keep you on your toes and yeah. I really did want to just skip because I wanted to skip to the end I, I needed to know like I need to know who did what and why did they do it? Yeah. <laughs> really good. Thank you. It's, a, it's a, a definite page turner. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. The album. Um, so I actually, hold on, sorry. I actually read your other book, The 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 Night Olivia Fell. Yeah. And so I liked the the rollover into this, into this book. Is that pretty common for your writing? Do you um do you do stories like that pretty commonly or is it was this yeah was yeah this I, I write this in the genre. Genre. I like, wait. okay yeah I was like wait I know this character <laughs> and I had to go back and reference the other book <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no I write in the thriller genre um I yeah all of my books so far have been in this genre um my third one do no harm it's still in the thriller genre but there is more of like a book club element about it because it's about the opioid complex uh, sorry, epidemic, not complex, opioid epidemic, which is very complex. And the story is, is there's a lot to talk about. So while there is a thriller plot, there's still like a real world contemporary setting. Um, but all of my other books are just pure thriller. I'm sure that'll definitely be interesting, the opioid epidemic, yeah. you know, because they talk a lot about opioid like now. I mean, that's, like yeah, a yeah. growing topic too you know people are always discussing that as well yeah um I wanted to talk Run about away. uh <laughs> yeah I wanted to mention the um when they were talking about that she, uh, Eva had no time to grieve um on page 128 you know uh I thought about that when because her life was like once her mom died it was just non-stop you know yeah. she was doing this she was doing that and she never really had time to just sit yeah. And literally greed, you know, yeah. and that happens in real life. You yeah. know, when death comes, you're just doing this. You got to go back to work. You got to do this. You know, you take a couple of days off, but yeah. it's like your life still keeps going, yeah. you know, and no one has, I guess, the appropriate amount of time to literally just sit and grieve, you know, or whatever you're supposed to do, you know, just yeah. they don't have that time. Yeah. So, no, it's so true. I think our lives are so busy, you know, and, and I think in America, especially, you know, there's, there isn't a lot of, um, like grievement time off bereavement leave. You get what, two days <laughs> and you don't really get compassionate leave. You don't really get a lot of time to just go, actually, I need to take a week, a month to just feel this. And that can lead to its own kind of trauma, PTSD, even in some cases. And that can lead to a lot of other mental health issues as well because if you're if we're not dealing with these things then they become heavy in in our in our minds and in our body absolutely absolutely um anybody else have a question 
I could keep going. Okay, next, I want to talk about the women. The women, I just, you know, certain things just stuck out to me and I have, you know, I got a billion and talk about them. <laughs> um, you spoke about, uh, in the book, it said, women are seven times more likely than men to choose poison as their murder weapon. Mm, yes. I that was very shocked when true. I heard that. Yeah. Men tend to be more violent. Women are a little bit more cerebral in general. This is a gen massive generalization. Um, so a, a man is more likely to use a gun, maybe even a knife and do something violent. Whereas a woman is a little bit more, look at the, the serial killers in America. Most of them are uh, nurses and they've all killed with poison or insulin, you know? So they're, they're quite often, it's a secret killing. It's a lot more silent. Wow. Oh, I'm taking notes, by the way, just in case you wanted to know. Oh, I'm taking notes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think this because comes that's, to that's, that's 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 my, that's that's new. Like, I've, I've never heard of that. Like, I don't yeah. know. They, I mean, I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. But women that's in general delighting. tend to be we insulate. And again, these are all complete generalizations. But statistically speaking, crimes that are committed by men are external they they externalize their anger whereas women internalize their anger into sadness and that's why women are more likely to be to do self-harm to cut themselves um whereas men are more likely to act out and be violent to punch somebody so women tend to deal with things differently than than men do i can understand that yeah i just didn't know it but i can understand that <laughs> Yeah, so that was very enlightening when you, when mm. you said that. Mm. Um, anybody else? Anybody else have anything to say? Questions? I do. I have a question. Uh, okay, so um, when throughout the book, I was picking up. Um, of course, again, I told you psychological thrillers are like my favorite genre, so I'm always thinking who done it, and I'm yeah. always looking for Easter eggs. I think the first time I kind of suspected Liam, but not yeah. of what, that wasn't until the end, but suspected that he had some involvement because he was being yeah. very suspicious and creepy was yeah. when, um, well, first of all, when you introduced Jacob, that had my, because, you know, there was another, because usually in these kind of books, when there's another male lead, that means the main man, there's something with them because this <laughs> other one is kind of raiding in the shadows. That was the first sign. But the second sign for me was when she couldn't find her, her engagement ring. And he mm -hmm. said, I'll buy you another one very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Then that's another thing. So I'm wondering, did you purposely leave Easter eggs uh, throughout the book? Or did you want your audience to remain, you know, in the dark until the very end? No, no, I purposely leave Easter eggs. Because if, if a reader gets to the end and there's been no like little red herrings or little clues along the way, they'll be like, wait, what? This is confusing. So you have to, yeah, leave these kind of red herrings and make this person look guilty and that person look guilty. So I want to look, kind of lead you there. And then you can think, oh, maybe it's Liam, but oh, maybe it's Jacob and maybe it's this other person, this other person, you know, so you kind of go maybe, but maybe not. And then oh. you go, ah, oh, okay, it is. You know what I mean? So I have to- No, yeah. That makes sense because then we might yeah. feel betrayed almost like if yeah. someone came from nowhere, it yeah. would feel like almost like a betrayal. So that makes right. perfect sense. Yeah, it'd be okay. just like out of left field. Like, what? Where'd this guy come from? Yeah. Why? Okay, makes perfect so I, sense. I have to at least hint it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But his character was tricky to write, actually. And I, I didn't get it right the first time. My editor had me go back like two different times to really work on his character because I wanted him to be like a manipulative gaslighter, but also the bad guy. But you have to make somebody like this also redeeming. So I had to show that he was, he did really love her, but he was also obsessive about her. <laughs> so it was like showing the good and the bad in order to lead you to him being actually, he's a bit more bad than you thought. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. It makes perfect sense actually. Yeah. Anybody else? I wanted to mention when Rose, died jumped over the bridge and drowned um yeah when um Eva was sitting on the on the um bench I was saying you know she was sitting somewhere and saw Rose by the tree mm -hmm. yeah I was like what <laughs> Rose is alive 
I'm thinking she dead. You know what I'm saying? Like I really thought she was yeah. gone, and then she. Oh, when Cat Cat saw nowhere. her, yeah. Well, Cat, that's what I mean. Cat yeah, yeah. saw her, and I just thought like maybe it was just a figure. Like maybe she thought. You know how people? I yeah, thought yeah, yeah. maybe I, that was I the. Thought, yeah. I thought I saw her, but no, it's not really her. Then she came up to her and touched her and hugged, and I'm like, she's <sighs> alive. <laughs> real, you know and that was really clever of her to even think that quick because they were they didn't have that much time to really think this out you yeah. know they were trying to get away from um seb and seb, yeah get away you know they were trying to yeah. run away and and just to come up with that plan just so quickly yeah. she was like i'll meet you at the hotel and she said i'll and she's like well i just decided to leave the the care the little stroller with the note on there you know yeah. and and it just you know everything yeah. just worked out it was like wow you know yeah Cat yeah. is like yeah. she was a very fun character to write because she's so intelligent, she's so smart, and she can make those plans just like split second. She's just really, really clever. Like probably she's probably my my smartest, intellectually smartest character that I've written, and and that's why I wanted to make her a teacher and like explore science. And you know she's just very, very cerebral, but she has that capacity to really make plans on the fly and I yeah yeah she's good like that yeah she is definitely good um I wanted to talk about the childhood memories um mm -hmm. you can elaborate more on that but you stated in the book childhood memories becoming clearer Ch children can remember events before the age of three when they're small but by the time they turn seven those memories are lost sometimes forever even in the neurons of the developing mind yeah. Can you talk more about the, the childhood memory? Well, I was, when my kids were little, I learned that, so children go through um, like mental health, mental leaps is what they're called. So their brain will like really grow very suddenly. And when this happens, they quite often shed other brain cells. So, and it happens when kids are teenagers as well. And that's why teenagers can be so forgetful is because their brain is growing so, and their, their brain cells are turning over so rapidly that basically all those kind of building blocks in their neurons and in their brain, sometimes they lose their pathways. And so, and it happens when they're little as well, when they're going through these mental leaps. And I was reading that around the time that kids are about five, their brain develops in, in, in such a way that they, their brain basically wipes of memories, not all memories, but there's a significant brain wipe where, and it's not always at exactly five, but around five where they lose a lot of memories from before they're five. And I thought that really makes sense because I don't have a lot of memories from before I'm five, like a few, but yeah, I don't. And memories are a funny thing because you don't actually remember things. You remember the memory of something. So you can remember something. And then the next time you recall that memory, you'll recall it slightly differently. So you're only remembering the memory, right? So that's why our, our memories can get so warped and so disturbed. So I, for my whole life, thought that I had this memory of being in the car with my sisters. And my sister had this like My Little Pony doll. She was probably three. And I have this memory of taking the My Little Pony doll and throwing it out the car window while we're on the freeway. <laughs> And then it turned out, and I only found this out a few years ago, that I didn't do that. She did it to <laughs> her other little sister. And I was like blown away that I had this completely wrong memory my whole life. I thought I was the meanest person in the world to take my sister's My Little Pony doll and throw it out the car window. But it wasn't even me who did it. <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's exactly it. It's like we're always remembering the memory. And so we can get something slightly wrong. And then the next time we'll get something even more wrong. And and um but that big back to that that brain wipe that big brain wipe happens around the time when we're five and so that's why it's hard to recall a lot of the memories from before then wow interesting very interesting yeah yeah i think about kids um you know who has a uh, experience loss of a of a mm. uh, parent yeah, uh, at a, such an early age, and I've yeah. always wondered, no, do they remember at all? You know, like what do you remember? You know, because yeah. they're so young, and then, like you said, they they shed their 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 memory. So it's like you just want to know, like, do you have yeah. any type of recollection of yeah. at that time? You know, what yeah, happened? I've wondered that a lot. I I don't know. Um, 
I'd imagine there would maybe be flashes like, and if they have a picture, they'd have a memory of the picture. Maybe they would even put the picture into a place. You know what I mean? So I think it's probably more about a feeling, a sense inside of them than really any hardcore memories, like hard coded memories. But I don't know for sure. Yeah. It would be interesting to know yeah. a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And even thinking from my own experience, um, I, I remember when I was five, just in kindergarten, I was Cinderella in the play mm -hmm. in kindergarten. But I don't remember the whole play, but I remember being Cinderella. You yeah. know, I remember just one thing of this boy calling me by my name instead of Cinderella by mistake, you know? <laughs> but it's like, I don't have no clue. Like, how could I even done something like that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's the main character. You got to remember all these lines. Yeah. Like, I don't remember, you know, and sometimes, thank God, I have footage of certain things I did when I were when I was younger. And I'm just like, wow, you know. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. but Yeah, yeah no, I mean, some of those memories are just lost and you, you can't really regain them unless you ask somebody else like your mother and go, well, what happened to, during this performance of Cinderella? And then they can tell you more. But yeah, sometimes it's just lost. That's why I think it's so important. I try to tell people, please have so much footage of your children when they're younger so they can yeah. see themselves. You go back yeah. to uh, show them when they're grown. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of times we didn't do that and we didn't have that type of stuff when we were growing up. We didn't have yeah. phones that had pictures and, you know, all that. So it's Same. so important to try to have that live footage of them at that time. Yeah. yeah. So, anybody else have questions? Anyone else? All right. Um, I think that's all for today. Okay. So cool. We'll cut it short. Nice um, again, yes, yes. Thank you again for uh, coming on and taking time out your busy for schedule to join mm -hmm. us. Um, we're still kind of new. We'll be. Yeah. Um, we just celebrated our fourth anniversary in June. Okay. So um, we're excited for your five. You know. Yeah, just keep yeah. going and going and hopefully we'll come around and read another one of your books and get yeah, you chosen <laughs> yeah, actually and... Lissandra one of our members Lissandra chose your book um we do a lottery pick so yeah. um your your book got chosen for this month so oh, <laughs> well if you have um if anybody has prime my new book is on Amazon Prime for free if you want to read it for free I'll show you oh, wow okay Black Waters. Prime. so it's on Prime if you have Prime it's your Kindle first reads book. Um, and that's only until the end of the month. And then it goes on proper sale. <laughs> okay, perfect. Is any of your, um, I might have one more question. Did any, yeah. if, if any of your books became a motion picture? So the night Olivia fell was, has been optioned. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and I hope up next will be... <laughs> Yeah, I hope uh, so. I hope up next. I hope up next will be behind every lie. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely be waiting for that movie, but I want to see that one as well. The other one. Um, and what was the name of it again? The new one is *The Still Black Waters*. Okay, and the movie. The that's um the night Olivia fell. It's been optioned. It hasn't been made yet. Okay, the night Olivia fell. All right. All righty. Well, um, like I said, hopefully we'll read another one of your books and have you yeah. back on with us. Yeah, definitely anytime. And thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks so You're much. welcome. Thank You're you welcome. for coming. Thank you, you. for talking to <laughs> us. <laughs> have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. 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 Okay. So everybody, did you all enjoy that discussion? I did. Yeah. Yeah, very much. I did too. Yeah, it's always amazing when an author comes on. Um, I, I I don't know if I, you all remember, but I did say that I wanted to have more authors on because I kind of um kind of was like um I was reaching out to authors in the beginning, but sometimes they don't really respond. I kind of I think I kind of got discouraged. Like, let me just stop asking them. You know. <laughs> I think after we had the one with um, Lysandra's friend, um, Dushima, um, I, I was asking, but no one really said yes. So I was like, okay, let me put that to the side. But um, yeah, uh, 